Good afternoon, everybody, from a slightly rainy and uh, dis dismal London this afternoon. I'm very glad you, you can join us. We're going to have a lovely discussion um, previewing um, a fine jewels auction by Indian auction house Saffron Art. Um, I am delighted to be joined by Minal Vazirani, a co-founder of Saffron Art. Hello, Minal. How are you today? Hi, David. Very well. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Um, so we're going to have a little chat with Minal, a little bit about the uh, auction house and its history and also about the auctions uh, market for uh, fine jewels in this period before we go on to a presentation of some of the highlighted consigned items in the fine jewels online auction of Saffron Art, which will take place on the 28th and 29th of October. Um, but Minal, could, could I ask you first off, could you tell us a little bit about the story of Saffron Art, um, how you came to found the company? Sure. Um, so we are exactly 20 years old this year. Uh, I started the company in 2000. Um, it was actually uh, a very strange beginning. Uh, I'd written a business plan when I was at business school uh, and never thought I would do anything with it. And um, came to a point where as I began to look uh, at my interest in art, uh, it was something my husband and I spent a lot of time on together. We were very keen on, on Indian art in particular because we had moved to India. And um, as we began buying, we found it very difficult to get information on pricing. Uh, the best art was difficult to access. And so we actually decided to start this company that did something very simple. It basically allowed people uh, anywhere in the world to access modern and contemporary Indian art and have a complete listing of prices. Um, and I know this sounds very intuitive today, but uh, in 2000, it, you know, as I've said many times, so Google wasn't a verb. Uh, you know, you couldn't just Google it. You couldn't go out and say, look, I'd like to know the price of X or Y and uh, how much should I pay for it? So that was really, um, <clears throat> that was the origin of this. And we thought there must be other people out there like us. And so we basically went live in April of 2000 with uh, a few thousand works of art with prices listed. And it was, I think, revolutionary at the time uh, because all of a sudden, if you were looking to buy Indian art, uh, as a collectible, you could come online and figure out what the prices were. And that was, uh, you know, that was a, a sort of a humble beginning, if you will, because from the day we began, we were entirely online. Um, very unusual <laughs> at that That's time to be selling art. Yeah. And um, the collectibles that you have offered are very much design-led across the board, aren't they? Can, can you tell us a little bit about your sort of um, business ethos in terms of uh, design focus? Well, I think, you know, when I would say when I first started, what, uh, the, the most common refrain that I heard was, oh, you're crazy. No one will ever buy art online. It's impossible, you know, or one of uh, the other part of the business, which was actually going out to meet with galleries, museums um, for for art and, and other collectibles. Uh, it was sort of, you know, there was a real hesitation um, coming from India. Uh, you know, and coming to meet with some of these gallerists who said, or, or, or institutions who'd say, well, look, we don't know enough about it. And is it really derivative of something or is it, you know, influenced by? So there were a lot of questions around these issues. Um, and I think what's, uh, what's important and, and what certainly I feel as though I learned over time, um, you know, although I had had some background in Indian art history, I think their key learning for me was realizing that aesthetics uh, from the Indian subcontinent is about a continuity. You know, whether we're talking about uh, a Chola bronze or we're speaking about a stone sculpture or we're talking about a Deccani miniature, uh, you know, or, or a Pahari painting. Yeah, all of these aesthetics sort of tie together and have such a strong influence in terms of the, the jewels that were created, um, in terms of the textiles that were created. So any, any collectible really, and I think um, it, it has been an ethos of the company to, to highlight that aesthetic history uh, that India brings, which is over 5,000 years old. Yeah. And during this unprecedented period of, of the coronavirus pandemic, we have seen an acceleration of digital technologies um, across the auction space. I mean, 
in India, particularly, how has the um, online digital market market been uh, during this lockdown period uh, and beyond uh, for you? Well, you know, I think anybody who says, "Look, I know what's going to happen," or "I knew what was going to happen," um, isn't being entirely truthful. And I, I, I think what was what was important for us is that we were willing to experiment and try out. Um, the market essentially during this time. So as we went into a lockdown in India, which you have to realize was an absolute and complete lockdown as so no one could leave their homes. When we went into this lockdown in March, um, we, we had geared up for our next set of art auctions. And as a result, we began gearing up and said, look, let's work very quickly to source some things so that we can continue to do online auctions. And I think that was really the distinguishing factor for us, <coughs> excuse me, us as a company, because we'd always been online, this transition was perhaps a little bit easier uh, in, to execute. Um, you know, we shifted whatever we could to the cloud, although we were already in the process of doing that. And this consisted of basically putting smaller collections together on another platform. So we have two platforms, we have Saffron Art, which is very much our high-end, um, you know, top of the market sort of um, fine art, fine collectibles. And we do periodic auctions, curated auctions with publications for that. And we also have Story Limited, which is, are just pieces that may be limited edition. It may be, um, you know, slightly lower value. It's, it's a much wider audience that accesses that. But the big innovation with Story was that we did no reserve auctions. And we began doing a bit of that with art early on. We used to do sort of, you know, one auction a month. And during the lockdown, we went, um, if I can sort of com compare between, um, you know, uh, I would say <clears throat> if I can compare between uh, 2019 and 2020, I'll give you some numbers I have on it. But overall, basically what happened was we uh, had about 350% more auctions March to September 2020 than we did March to September 2019. And for, for jewelry, um, we sold about 18 times as much jewelry this year in terms of number of lots than we did at this point last year. So there's been a real, real escalation upwards. And I think part of that is people just have the time, you know, and they're willing to look online and, and willing to engage. How important do you think trust in the auction house is in terms of engendering confidence in online bidding for fine jewels, for example? The fact that a potential bidder could potentially contact you and seek advice, either in terms of consigning or in terms of what they're seeking to bid upon. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Actually, it's, I think it's important for any collectible, um, as it should be, because by its very nature, collectibles, whether it's art or jewelry, um, antiquarian books, textiles, there's, uh, you know, there, there is a bit of expertise required. And the pricing is not necessarily an exact. So there, there's, there has to be some understanding of, of sort of the quality um, versus the value and, and where that should price out. So a big part of what we did was we actually took exhibitions to different cities around the world. Uh, for art and certainly of jewelry as well. So we've done uh, jewelry exhibits uh, and we preview our collections in different cities. And, and I think that's been wonderful for people who'd like to come and see the pieces and for us to sort of learn from clients and learn from a fresh pair of eyes what some of those questions are. I think the, probably the biggest testament to building that trust um, with clients though is I've had on multiple occasions clients coming back and saying you know thank you for this because i've sort of been able to uh get it valued you know i hadn't bought from you before i was a bit concerned in some cases they've had things valued and realized they've done quite well uh, with their acquisition so it builds up over time but we've tried to be as transparent as we can and you've said that the, the market for fine jewels online has been, you know, very buoyant during this period. Can, can you say in sort of general terms, what type of fine jewels have been selling particularly well? And maybe what type of fine jewels have not sold as well in this period? 
I, that's a particularly important question. I think, um, you know, because we've been doing no reserve sales and keep in mind a no reserve auction of jewelry is highly, highly unusual. Um, so, you know, perforce the curation of those has been around smaller objects, maybe not sort of the, the top end. So smaller objects, but um, that have an element of rarity or uniqueness, whether it's design or, you know, it's a particularly lovely stone, certified stone. So it's been more around, I would say, smaller objects. Certainly, I would say the price band has been a little bit lower um, for two reasons. One, it's very difficult, you know, if, you, if you'd like to go and see something and the entire country is in a lockdown, it's not as though you can go in and have a look at the piece. So we've done virtual viewings and, and things like that. But I think the other part of it is there is a little bit of uncertainty. And so to your point, there is this overall sort of, if I may use, use a financial term, there is a flight to quality. So I think in any time of uncertainty, spend, certainly I don't think we could be well, that sounded a bit funny, didn't it? When I said, certainly, I don't think we could be in more uncertain times, but <laughs> but, um, but I think that when people are looking to make an acquisition, an investment, a purchase that they feel would be a good store of wealth for the long term or something they'd like to pass on to a family member or gift, I think definitely quality is what, uh, what people are looking for at the moment. So, so it's a combination of the beauty of the piece Sorry, David, I lost your uh, sound for a moment. Could you repeat that? Yeah, do you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, um, so essentially is the attraction of fine jewels has been the combination of being beautiful, but also being seen as possibly a store of value. Yes, absolutely. So I think, um, you know, whether it's, it's uh, a piece of gold jewelry, which as you can see, you know, with, with uh, precious metals and commodity prices, I mean, certainly gold has gone up dramatically. And that has always, I mean, that's traditionally in India been a safe haven for investment. So that certainly had an impact. We have seen a much greater interest in, in diamonds as of late. Um, and of course the colored stones, I think are always, uh, always a favorite. So it's, if they're certified, if they're important, not necessarily at the top end of the market in terms of auction, much of that in India, strangely enough, ends up being transacted on privately. Okay. Great, so before we move on to your presentation of the highlighted consigned pieces in the auction of Saffron Art on the 28th and 29th of October, could you just talk us through um, the process for uh, bidders, um, how they can register uh, on the Saffron Art website and a little bit about the, how the auction works online and, and please do feel free to show uh, slides. Yeah, um, and you know, I, I will do that to some extent, but it's actually, I'm gonna show you quickly on my phone because it is very, very, very simple with us. Um, the fact is you can certainly go online at saffronart.com and what you have to do is register to bid. Once you register and put in your details, uh, you then get access. There's a, a small verification procedure um, where uh, it's sort of a know your customer details are verified and so on, but you can basically get access to the catalog um, and have interaction an interaction with one of our team members um, from our client management team who will help get your bidding activated. But just to give you an idea, this is our mobile app. So this is my phone, it's our mobile app. And basically uh, the best thing to do is to actually just register on the app. So, you know, uh, go to the Apple store, you can download it, you can then get in here and sort of click on any of these. It'll bring up all of the details. Uh, you can place advanced bids, you can bid. Um, so, you know, I would like to sort of touch upon this actually, since you asked. Uh, it's a very simple process, it's very intuitive, but this is something we've been doing for uh, about a decade, funnily enough. Uh, actually, so about, yeah, about 10 years ago in 2010, we released, uh, our first mobile bidding app for art. And it was actually the only real-time bidding app for fine art. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of talk as of late about um, high value bids coming in online you know, during the um, global pandemic that's happened, everything's moved online, and that you know, there have even bids, been bids and pieces sold <coughs> around a million dollars. So 
Uh, I do want to point out, you know, it's something we're very comfortable with and that we know well, because in, in 2011, we had a painting for sale on our website, um, yeah. on our app, um, in an auction. And that was, you know, estimated at about $200,000 to $400,000. It finally sold for $1.3 million. And that, that winning bid came in on the mobile app. For many years thereafter, the highest value ever bid on a mobile app was with Saffron Art globally. So, quite something, isn't it? Um, and it just shows that the security and the transaction digitally, um, the camera technology is vastly enhanced these days. Um, and you know, the, 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 the transaction essentially is a secure one. Well, thanks so much for that. So let's now move on to your presentation of the highlighted consigned items. Okay. In the Art, October 28, 29, Fine Jewels online sale. So okay. over, over to you. Great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'll skip over the first couple of slides because we've, we've discussed much of that already. Um, this is just, you know, these are our early sort of catalog covers. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, very clear. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to quickly skip over this. Uh, jewelry was our very first expansion. Um, was something that I did want to mention, and it's uh, it's quite significant because one of the things I want to point out as we talk about trust and being able to do this online is the fact that. Um, you know, we, we picked the worst possible time to enter jewelry. This was October 2008, um, right after the world had collapsed in its worst economic crisis. Um, so this, is our, uh, this was our first catalog with this large yellow fancy diamond here. And, you know, it's, uh, it was off to a rocky start, but it's been a wonderful experience since where we've done jewels. We've done uh, jewelry and uh, furniture in this case, uh, where we focused on art deco. Um, and we have now come to really what is our annual sale every year before the festival of Diwali, um, which is a festival of lights here. So I will jump in on that right away. Uh, this is the cover of our catalog. And um, I'd like to sort of point out the, the, real, the really important thing about this is we've, We've adhered to the idea of themes in nature and tried to bring out how closely these are tied to the various arts of India. So I'd like to start off talking about um, uh, three very interesting lots. And the first is a book, and you can see it on the top right corner. It's called Jaipur Enamels. Jaipur in this case is spelled the way it's pronounced, um, uh, you know, in English. Um, and it has pictures of these, uh, these fabulous, uh, what, what are called karas or, or bangles. And uh, these uh, are, you know, the, this book contains representations. It's a book uh, published in, I believe the mid 1800s uh, to late 1800s. I think there were two editions of it. And um, <coughs> you can just see that the, um, the karas or the bangles shown here are very, very similar to the pieces that we have in the auction. The other part of this I'd like to point out are these four gentlemen that you see here. Uh, those are the, the craftsmen who have been identified in this, this antiquarian book uh, by name, by trade, and by specialty. And it's incredible because there's such, uh, such a place of pride for this craftsmanship and technique. It is something that's passed on through geographies. It is something that's certainly passed on within families. And, you know, and it's, it's particularly uh, important to jewelry that comes out of India. So this, um, as you can see, has these karas. I'd like to skip over to this lot here. Uh, this is called a makara. It's referring to this head here, if you will. Uh, it's intertwined head. And um, you can see even the teeth are visible here. This, what you see here is our two intertwined elephants, but on this, there are two intertwined, intertwined uh, crocodiles. And um, you can see these are set with polki or diamonds all the way around and beautifully done enamel. Um, this piece was probably created, I would say in uh, the mid 1800s, where 
I would say circa 1850 or 1860, um, but it's an exceptionally, exceptionally good condition. Uh, and visually it has many references in books such as these. Would, you know, part, now, would you know me now from which part of India um, it was made? So, so these, um, this is uh, Jaipur, this card right here. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to this piece here. Uh, and this is, you know, it's estimated uh, the same as the other one. It's not as, uh, it's not as old a piece. It's probably, I would say in the region of somewhere between 70 to 90 years. We haven't been able to pinpoint it exactly. So we're very careful about giving a range. Um, and if you actually, what's exciting about this one, if you look at it, certainly you can find references in this book for a kara like this. But if you see this, if you take a look at the enameling here, it's very reminiscent of um, uh, Deccani motifs. And I wanna point that out in particular because you know, when I, when I discuss the continuity in Indian aesthetics, uh, the thing about uh, Deccani miniatures is that uh, they were probably uh, amongst the finest from, uh, from the subcontinent that you can see. In fact, there's an incredible collection of Deccani miniatures at the Guimet um, in Paris. But, but I want to explain this a little bit more. Um, this enameling is called Minakari. And I'm sorry if this is repetitive for any of the audience out there, but it is a technique that really found its its footing and, and <coughs> peak, I would say, in the 16th and 17th centuries uh, during the reign of Akbar. However, it was probably introduced um, earlier, according to some historians, in the 13th century in Punjab. But but I think what's what in terms of it spreading throughout the subcontinent uh, that happened uh, through the reign of the Mughals. And it's very tied into the miniature painting technique, uh, the specific colors, the motifs, uh, the florals, you know, and the kinds of flowers, in fact, um, that are created are reminiscent of uh, the idea of, of the reference to paradise. So that's why these are so particularly important. I'll just move on to the next one. So you, you, know, you, I, you term this Minal art jewelry, presumably. Well, it's, you know, I, I think in India, where does one begin and the other end? I, it's, uh, I think that's what's particularly important about what we see um, that's come out of India really for the last, particularly for the last uh, maybe 500 years. So I'd like to um, now go to this slide. Uh, this, I just wanna point this out. This is, oops, um, let me go back. This is a bejeweled royal attendant. Um, and this painting is actually is on a door um, in Rajasthan. It's a 19th century painting. Uh, this is from the Maranga Fort Museum in Jodhpur. But I'd like you to just notice for a moment how, to what extent she's adorned. Um, and this is an attendant. You know, um, I, I think it's, it's incredible. You can see her earrings, you can see her necklaces, um, you can see, you know, um, her, her, bracelets, uh, you can see on her arm uh, what's referred to as a bazu bun. And bazu means your arm, your, up, your arm up here. And if you take a look over here, let me try and move my mouse over. If you can see my mouse, uh, you, see, you can see this here. And this is uh, a bazu bun that she's wearing. She's wearing multiple bazu buns, but this one in particular, if you take a look, <coughs> you see it's a similar motif to this bazu band, as well as the reverse um, of, of this one here. There's, you know, and, and these all had a purpose. Every stone in there had a purpose. This piece, for example, uh, let me find my mouse again. There it is. This, whoops, this piece in the uh, bottom right corner of, of the screen is called a Navratan. And this refers to the nine gems or the nine planets. And what's believed in Indian, in Indian um, astrology and when it comes to gems is that gems confer certain kinds of talismanic properties or certain energies um, and having the nine planets in harmony is protective or, or talismanic in some way. So this is the front of it. 
Um, what's amazing about these pieces is uh, are the backs of these pieces. I'd like to take stop sharing for a moment, and I'd like to just uh, have uh, my colleague Aditi, uh, whom I haven't introduced, but we'll have her pop in for a second and say hi uh, later. Um, and she's going to show us the detail on these pieces because it's incredible. I think the front and the back are both exquisite. So I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment. Actually, if you could show us the Karas to start with Aditi, that would be great. So if you can have a look there, you can see Aditi is holding the um, antique Kara there. Where you can, you know, even when you're looking at it on this call, you can see the teeth. You can see um, the cut on the diamonds. You know, they're not as flat as you see in more modern pieces. They have facets, they have depth. And you can, you know, you can begin seeing the flowers in here. They, and that's where a, the, the skill of the craftsmen, I don't, I don't even know if I would call them craftsmen. I mean, they're artists. It's being able to paint that way on gold is incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll elaborate a little bit on some of the materials in the piece. So uh, the, the painting is all done on gold uh, and the, you know, these pigments are especially created for this. So you can see the polki or the diamonds set in the green enamel on the outside. The, and then you'll see here, the, the rim is in a blue enamel. And then the inside has a white uh, background with these beautiful red flowers. And you know, the kinds of flowers that typically we see in uh, the Minankari tradition include, uh, gosh, um, you know, chrysanthemums, lotuses, poppies, uh, rosebuds. Um, and I think this may be a reference to poppy flowers. So there's, if you could just show us the other Thara's, uh, other, the other Thara and the um, back of the piece. Oh, and here's the one that, again, this is a darker blue enamel with diamond uh, polkies that have been set in. And if you look at the back of it, uh, you can, there we go, you can begin seeing that incredible detail um, here on painted on the inside. It's just, it, I mean, and this is that reference to, you know, the borders that you see in Mughal miniatures, uh, a reference to some of the Deccani motifs that you see for, for the, the flora. And if you can show us the Bazuband as well. And then this is the, the Bazuband actually, which was the last um, piece that I showed you. Now this is the front, but let's have a look at the back. It's, so those are emeralds there and diamonds with a drop at the bottom. Here's the back. I mean, it's incredible to me, you know, that to be able to look at, at this in terms of, you know, the luxury of having the wearer um, hold this next to their body. This is, this is never seen. This is just for you as the wearer to know that there's beauty inside and out. Um, it's, it's incredible. It's always the test of a very high piece of jewelry, what the back looks like, isn't it? What, very much so. And actually I'm going to just sort of point out, um, I wanna, actually, can we come to that in a second? So let me show this, okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and show it now, that's fine. This, we're going to see this on screen as well. <coughs> The back of this, this is a bazuban, this is the reverse, and it is simply outstanding. You know, I, I wish you could sort of run your hand over it. It's an absolutely smooth surface. It's spectacular the way those flowers are done. You know, when we, when we illustrated this for the catalog, um, that's the real test because when you blow it up, you see how fine the line is. You know, you can see how it's been painted on the gold. And it's, it, it really gives you an idea of, of how much care and attention was put into the jewel. And if you take a look at the front of this, you can see it's also, it's um, a large emerald cabochon and you have these, uh, these polky diamonds again set in gold. I'd like to just show you both the bazubans for a moment. Uh, any idea where that emerald would have come from? Perhaps a question for Aditi. Well, um, I'm going to have Aditi answer that in a second. I do want to kind of uh, give you an idea, though, where it's come to us from. So um, this one, uh, sorry, the, the one on, on top. So this one has actually come to us uh, from an important Sikh family who would have been uh, formerly a princely family. <clears throat> and I think you could just focus on the backs of those for a quick second. Um, 
you know, as I'd mentioned, much of this, this type, of, type of Minakari is said to have originated in Punjab and then moved down. Now, I want to explain. Uh, so this, can you just point to the jib where you, uh, if you I know you have your trouble, having trouble doing it with both hands. So, so this one is, whoops, there we go. So that's. Oh, we can see it really well, actually, the detail. Okay, great. So, you know, different regions had different um, different ways of doing the enameling. And, and in Jaipur and in Rajasthan, they would, it would sort of get raised. So it was the way it was, the color was applied and the way the pieces were, were fired in a sense. And so it would give it this raised three-dimensional kind of feel. Whereas the other one is quite flat. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for a moment now. There was a question, Minal, um, yes. that came in from Pranit, um, who was asking, um, how do you ascertain, say, the period of some of these pieces? Um, and he talked about the provenance as well. Um, do you have to make an educated guess, or I mean, can you be reasonably precise? Well, we, you know, we we do it ourselves to some extent, but we also have outside experts that we work with, um, and it's it's a combination of many many different elements. It will be, and I'll have Aditi step in on this with me also, but it's a combination of the way the stones are cut. Uh, it's the way that they're set. Uh, we have to take a look at how the piece is aged. Um, and you know, sometimes it's as simple as, as touching it and feeling it and getting a sense for it. You're, I, I, and I know this is going to sound strange, but um, it, it's a bit like training your eye and training your fingers. You can sort of feel, uh, when, when something is, is of an earlier vintage um, than a more recent one. Aditi, would you like to jump in on, on any of that? I'm gonna mute myself so that you can speak and then we don't have to have any interference. Yeah, so in general, when we are not able to get guaranteed uh, you know, inputs on how exactly the dating of that piece goes, we do not lay our hands on that because what we stand for is a surety for our clients. So we do go back and check with family records, whatever photographs, whatever uh, archival material we can get hold of, along with the consultants, the historians that we work with, and then only we come back on what our estimated age on that piece would be. If we are not sure, we won't go ahead with that piece. And um, I did hear a quick follow up in terms of sort of uh, ascertaining origin of um, precious stuff. Sorry, is... David, I lost your sound for a second. Yeah, you hear me now? You hear me now? Um, I'm not able to you hear, hear you. You hear me now? Can you hear me? Gosh, I'm not I able can to hear, hear you. you. I can hear you. Oh. There we go. Okay. Got me. Yeah. Yep. Um, I was just asking a follow-up no. question um, uh, to Aditi, um, yep. which was um, how how can you sometimes know the origin of some of these precious stones, such as the emeralds that we saw earlier, the in, in the, these antique pieces? Um, do you ever have to make an educated guess, or would you only state? The origin once you're absolutely certain that you you know the origin? Of yes. The exactly. Stones? Exactly. So when we, are, when we do not have any, um, you know, estimated guess on the piece, uh, we do not give out the origin. You know, we can definitely say that we think this comes from such and such region, but we do not mislead uh, any client or any bidder that's there in our auction. Having said that, uh, if the piece is genuinely old, we know that there are relatively fewer sources that, can, that they can come from. So you can take a guess to a certain extent, but it's very difficult to pinpoint which exact mine or which exact region they came from. So we leave our best judgment with our clients. And from there on, it's a discussion. Thank you very much. If I could jump in very quickly, I, I think part of um, you know what Aditi is alluding to also is the fact that um, if we're able to date the piece, we have an idea um, historically and from records to know whether, for example, it was only Colombian emeralds that we will see. You know, could it have been emeralds from um, you know from the mines in Afghanistan, um, or would it have been Colombian? And the fact is, Aditi is a gemologist. Um, uh, we have another gemologist as well who heads up our Delhi team, uh, Amit, 
And, uh, you know, between the two of them, they, they will actually take a look at the piece, microscope it, um, and to that extent are able to sort of look at the characteristics of the stone and figure out what the origin would be. So for an emerald, for example, uh, typically we find that they are uh, Colombian uh, in most of what we, what we come across as older pieces. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen <clears throat> again. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I skipped ahead, unfortunately, um, somehow, I'm not really sure how, um, but I just wanna go back to this. Uh, we, we looked at the, the top one. I'd like to just show you this, this bracelet on the bottom here. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, this is a bracelet with <clears throat> emeralds and diamond polki. And again, uh, you can see Aditi has shown this to us earlier. This was made in, in Jaipur. And, and this one is um, a beautiful, beautiful piece. It does have a much flatter, uh, so a much flatter type of enameling, but I want Aditi to show it to you quickly before I move on to the next lot of um, pieces. And if you can see that, you know, it's a very, if, Aditi, if you could show us the side of it, it's really a thin bracelet. You can go ahead and maybe put that on and, and just show us how thin it is on your wrist as well. Um, now other people want to go home with that, but it's um, it's gorgeous. You know, it's really thin. It's it, you can see the thickness of it. In in many of the newer pieces we see, we don't often see uh, such a such a thin uh, piece with the stones embedded as well as this quality of enameling. But that's really lovely. And not that this is very old. I would say it's probably kind of in you know, that 50 to 60 year range, but, but really lovely, uh, lovely piece. Okay, let me go back to this. All right, and on to our next, um, on to our next screen. This is the last batch of set of um, Indian jewelry that I would like to show. These earrings here, and you know, everything has a bit of a story. Um, you know, we talked about, sorry, my screen keeps doing that. You can see these earrings right in the middle. Uh, these are lot 32. This is a pair of what we call jhumki earrings, where it, this is called the jhumka here. Um, and it's gorgeous because it has this tassel. So every time you, you move, you see that movement in the earring. Um, and these earrings are traditionally called garn fools. When, if you recall the, the painting I showed you earlier, it's, these are very similar to the earrings she had in her ears. And so these traditions have continued for centuries and the way they're worn has also continued for, for centuries. Um, to that extent, if you, if you take a look at these flowers here, they're obviously modified, but these have an, an interesting story for us because uh, the consigner who, who brought them to us, uh, they were given to her on her wedding by her mother-in-law and she's kept them for all these years and uh, is now, now offering them up. Uh, these uh, garn fools also, uh, again, garn fool just means a flower in your ear, basically. These uh, are from a different kind of royalty. These are from Bollywood royalty. So um, from an actress uh, who was very, very well known uh, in the 1960s. So um, these, are, these are from her and that's about all I can say about those. So, Minel, can I ask you just in general yes. terms, how yep. important is provenance to you in terms of researching it and then communicating it uh, in the auction process? And what are the limitations sometimes that you face in, in terms of communicating provenance? That's a great question, David. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's really an issue in India because I think people are, are very concerned about uh, sort of publishing uh, the fact that they may be selling uh, their jewelry and it has all kinds of, you know, personal um, societal implications perhaps for them. So people tend to be very private about it. <clears throat> you know, we, we hesitate to print anything unless we're able to verify it. I mean, to give you an example, uh, some of the pieces I showed you, which are where the provenance is an important Sikh princely family, I haven't printed it in the catalog simply because I don't have documentation to that effect. But I, you know, I know where it's from. We've researched it. Um, we're 
pretty confident about it. Uh, and we just, you know, we don't make any claims that are not verified. And that's very, very important to me because it's one of the, one of the basic tenets of our company is, is to be, you know, to be transparent and to provide that trust to our clients. But, but you sure, are, you, are is to, you are able to, to tell the story and you can verify that story then obviously you will do so because that, that really enhances the value of the piece in every sense doesn't it and, you know it, when it does we you know we had a necklace um that was from the maharaja of Dhumrao, which was i believe the oldest uh indian state uh, princely state you know and and we had that years ago it we just couldn't sort of um you know we couldn't put in the information because they were sensitive about it. of course it was many years ago and i can i can probably talk about it now we we had we had a piece in fact we had a diamond that we offered in a sale a few years ago that belonged to um uh, to someone i knew well who used to wear it <clears throat> and uh his widow he was in his 80s his widow uh, offered it to us on consignment uh, and it sold an auction. Um, I, I wish I could have talked about the story of that stone because it's incredible. Um, it was willed to him by his mother and she received it from her father. Now in that case, um, you know, we saw the will, we saw all of the documentation. We traced that, that stone so far back in this family. Uh, we traced it to the late 1700s. Uh, it was a type 2A diamond, um, you know, with a light sort of pinkish brownish color, it, it was beautiful. Uh, you know, to get a 10 carat Golconda diamond certified in that way was incredible. But it was a story that she didn't want us to tell at that time. So, uh, you know, we have to respect people's wishes and, and sort of move on. But, uh, but definitely I think those stories and that provenance means a great deal to whomever is acquiring the piece and enjoying the piece. So we're going to leave um, the Indian jewels behind for a moment, but just for a little moment, I'd like to start with uh, this ring over here on the right. This is um, a beautiful emerald ring. It's, it's not very large. Uh, it's a little over three and a half carats, but the origin of this ring is Panjshir. It's from the Panjshir mines in Afghanistan. So as you can imagine, um, aside from the fact that <clears throat> There's no material that had been found in these mines um, for quite some time. Uh, there, you know, given the situation uh, with geopolitics and, and the conflict, it's certainly not my, uh, you certainly wouldn't get material from there. So it is very rare to get a Panjshir emerald. Um, I've seen some other pieces, some old, old uh, Panjshir emerald beads. They have a very distinctive color and they're absolutely incredible. Uh, so I wanted to highlight that. I would um, like to point out that's lot 77 and it's really, you know, some of these pieces are exceptional prices. You know, it's a, the low estimate is about $4,800. Um, I'd like to move over now to this piece. Uh, this is a pair of earrings with uh, emerald melons. Uh, these are Zambian in origin and they're uh, about 113 carats. So they're very large. They have these beautiful diamond briolets up here um, and a diamond terminus at the bottom. These are natural saltwater pearls that they're seen with. These are, you know, this is one of those pieces, I have to say, that an image doesn't do it justice. It, it really, it, it's, a, it's a sight to behold. It's, it's absolutely spectacular. Um, and a different origin here. Uh, this is a pair of Colombian emeralds uh, that are, are on these... Uh, rose cut diamond earrings, a beautiful movement. The emeralds are um, about 24 and a half carats altogether and 6.17 carats of diamonds. Um, and you know, this, uh, it, it's made uh, here in India. What I love about these is there's, I mean, you don't see any metal with these earrings. You literally just see the stone and I'll show them to you in a moment. And these of course are gorgeous. <coughs> These are also Colombian emerald stones in the middle here. Um, insignificant oiling. Um, they're, they're not very, very large. Uh, it's about, you know, just under four carats for the pair, but they're absolutely clean, clear, gem quality, gorgeous um, earrings. Again, it, it's interesting to see some of these things coming out of India 
the way they're made is entirely different. So, so no metal whatsoever. It's, it's you, all you see is the stone and that's what these, uh, these two pairs of earrings are about. So let me stop sharing and have Aditi show these to you. And um, Aditi, if you don't mind, you. You can see the melons here. They're, they're just beautiful. If you can, if, you know, and Aditi's putting her hand on those. Um, they are very large. I mean, it, it, when, I hold, when I hold them in the palm of my hand, one melon sort of, you know, covers most of the center of my palm. So, and they're a gorgeous color, uh, beautiful, clean, clean melons. I, I, I haven't come across melons quite this clean in a very long time. So, um, you know, they, I think they're a superb buy. Um, and then the um, Bancher Emerald Ring. You can see this here. Aditi, if you want to just maybe hold that a bit closer outside of the stand, I think that would help. Um, so the Bancher Emerald, you'll see it's, it's an unusual color. And, and that's what I like about it quite so much. But it's just gorgeous. I mean, it's not tiny by any means. But um, as I said, it's very unusual to have something so lovely from this origin um, and for it to be faceted and, and set so so nicely. It's, it's a very different kind of green and you almost have to see it, I guess, to, to figure that out. These are the other earrings. Uh, these are uh, Colombian emeralds. As you can see, you can see the flat cut diamonds, rose cut diamonds. Um, they're gorgeous because like I said, all you see is the stone. Um, again, insignificant oiling, and these are, they're just clean as clean. It, it's sort of like two limpid green pools of water. Uh, they're fabulous. I'm going to show you one more ring um, that's also a Colombian emerald ring. Um, again, very nice, clean stone. Uh, so all of these, um, I believe, are certified, and the details are in the catalog. So we don't have to, um, you know, uh, get into that too much. I'm going to just start sharing my screen again very quickly um, and move on from here to the next slide. Um, this is uh, kind of a different sort of section. This is what I, oops, this is what I call stories and histories. And this is, this is kind of fun. Um, you know, it's a whole series of objects that, that sort of, um, every, where, everything has, where everything has a story. Um, I'd like to start with, uh, with this piece in the corner here. And this is a cigarette case. <coughs> And you can see it has a uh, it has a, a crest, uh, a family crest here. This is or coat of arms, if you will. Um, it's from the Natawat region, and uh, it, which is really a clan of um, Tikanas or noble home, uh, noble houses. Uh, and these are Rajputs. Uh, there, um, these Tikanas are located just outside of Jaipur, just for reference. Uh, they are. At Actually, of a Surya Vanshi lineage, which means they're uh, sun worshippers, so, so to speak, if I can use that in quotes. But it's it's amazing. Is that you know I love this um, these details because if you can see this, there's uh, there's of course a sun right at the top, and uh, this is just a very charming, elegant cigarette case uh, that that we came across. Um, and this this is quite oops this is quite fun as well. Uh, this cigarette uh, lighter and the cigarette case uh, came to us in a Maubusson um, case. They're, they're embedded with rubies uh, and with diamonds, Burmese rubies and, and diamond baguettes. Gorgeous, uh, you know, seem to be sort of probably 1940s, uh, late 1930s, early 1940s. So the seller um, insisted that these might uh, belong to the Gaikwad family because uh, there, was, uh, there were initials inscribed in them uh, in a very Art Deco script. And so we, of course, began our process of researching this. And, um, and I reached out to the Gaikwad family, to Radhika Rajay, and said, look, do you have a record of this? And, and she came back saying, I'm, you know, it's, it's lovely, but no, I can't find a record of it. So 
we've had to sort of, uh, you know, we, we had to sort of end our research there, unfortunately. But it really is an enigma because it's gorgeous. I mean, you know, who would have such an exquisite lighter and, and cigarette case? Um, it, it, so so it, it, has, it has a direction it could go in as a story, but certainly we weren't able to verify it. Um, the other could piece you, I'd like Minel, to... Minel, could you elaborate a little bit about the uh, extents to which sometimes you have to go in order to verify provenance and how important it is to you that provenance should be verified? Uh, yes, we've, we've had to, we've had to uh, fly down, check out what someone may have been saying. Um, you know, in this case, it's easier. We, you know, we, we reach out to those we're in touch with. Uh, we try and go through family records. In some cases, we've been able to verify uh, jewelry through, uh, I mean, in one case, it was through a painting. So I think, you know, it's, it's various ways in which you do it. Um, obviously, as I said, the, the place we start is by looking at the stones, uh, by looking at how they're cut, what they've been done at that time. In the, in the case of the lighter and the cigarette case here, you know, they have French hallmarks. Um, one of the, the areas has been buffed, it's, it's just sort of from use, it's become uh, indistinct. And, um, and so it's hard to see. So we haven't really ascribed a maker to this um, because there was a, a little bit of uncertainty um, in terms of what we were able to make out. Um, nor if we ascribe the provenance, we've uh, left it as just an interesting, an interesting story. And, and you know, I think what I love about these is uh, the person who acquires it has their own story to make of it. So they can sort of get into the research a bit if they, if they would like to. Uh, and I love the enigma that some of these pieces have. Um, I wanna skip down here to this. Um, this is very interesting. It's actually a commemorative, um, it's a commemorative uh, box. It could be a cigarette case. Um, it, you know, we're, we're not exactly sure, but that is what it looks like. And, um, it originally belonged to um, to Maharani Narendra Kaur, uh, who was the third wife of um, at the of the of one of the sons of the Maharaja of Kapoorthala. Uh, and I'm going to just um, give a little bit of the information about it because I have it in front of me. Um, she was uh, born Stella Much. Um, she was married to Maharaja Paramjit, Paramjit Singh. Uh, he was the eldest son of Maharaja Jagajit Singh. Um, and, you know, Maharani uh, Narendra Kaur, her family was particularly important. So the Kapoorthala family is particularly important um, because they were legendary patrons of uh, the Maison de Cartier. And this box uh, was made by Cartier London. It um, is inscribed Cartier London. Uh, it also has the hallmarks and it's stamped JC, presumably for Jacques Cartier. Um, so, it, you know, the, the Kaputalas were personal friends of all three Cartier brothers. Um, and this, it's most likely, it most likely actually belonged to Maharaja Jagat, Jagatjit Singh because he did attend the coronation of George VI uh, in 1937, where he wore the Kaputala Cartier uh, tiara. And so this was a commemorative box that um, he must have brought back. We did in our, in our research find another similar box with uh, this commemorative coin embedded in it. Was a, it was a smaller box, however, um, and it had come up for auction some years ago. Um, and I think, you know, particularly because of her English heritage, I think I would imagine she would have been sentimental uh, about the piece and, uh, and must have acquired it um, upon her husband's demise. So, you know, and, and when this came up, I did reach out to Cynthia Frederick who had participated in our jewelry conference uh, last year uh, and is the historian um, for Kaputala and is uh, obviously, you know, lives there. And so um, she reviewed the piece and, and, uh, and although she didn't have the specific record of it uh, there, you know, it was a wonderful story and she's, uh, shared these images of Maharani um, Narendra Kaur. So I think that's quite exciting uh, to have. I think she's going to be doing a webinar with Francesca Cartier and so she sent uh, this box to her as well. So it's, you know, it's, it's amazing how these stories link people together and that's what I find, um, what I find exciting about them. And this is a tiny little uh, sort of a desk or a bedside uh, clock. 
from the 1950s, uh, mid 1950s. So I'm now going to stop sharing and have Aditi quickly show you some of these so that you can um, get a sense of what they look like. Um, can I just ask you, Minal, before you do that, um, so Saffron Art uh, is, is open to uh, receive offers of consigned items from outside of India, is that correct? Absolutely, because we do have, uh, we have a, a gallery in London, uh, just on New Bond Street, and uh, we have uh, uh, an office in New York, um, uh, Madison and 57, so, you know, both right in the center of town, easy to reach. Um, so we're happy to take consignments, uh, you know, at either location. So uh, Aditi is just showing you the box. There's the commemorative coin for the coronation of George VI and Queen Elizabeth. Um, and it's really a beautifully done box. Uh, you won't be able to see the Cartier uh, stamp. Perhaps those are the hallmarks that are there. Uh, there's, of course, uh, JC's initials and um, You'll be able to see it uh, on the screen, but uh, it, it does have does say Cartier London. So, and then uh, this is the this is the little sort of uh, tabletop clock, folding travel clock, if you will, that's inscribed uh, with this basket weave gold and um, a line of diamonds for the envelope cover there. And uh, if you want to just have a look, this is the the gold cigarette case with all of these things I feel like I should take up smoking I mean it's just it's so elegant and so <laughs> fabulous but uh, maybe not such a good idea these days um, and then the cigarette lighter is uh, sorry I that he's excited about the cigarette lighter so the camera shaking uh, there we go it's it's beautiful you know it's so these are all individually cut stones um, those are the initials on the back lovely deco design for the initials. Roughly what date on that piece, do you know? On this, on the lighter um, and the, sorry, were you asking about the lighter? The lighter, the lighter yeah. I, I would say it's probably, you know, um, 19, late 1930s, early 1940s, because it, it is deco. Um, but, and I'm saying it a bit later because there's, there's a whole school of, of art deco that became very, very prominent in India. In fact, there's a region in Mumbai uh, which has been classified as a world as as an, one of the largest Art Deco sites in the world um, by UNESCO. And you know, we'd actually contributed to that effort a little bit um, a few years ago. But basically, Deco came to India later uh, than Europe. So it wasn't in the 20s; it was more in the 30s, and then went on through the 40s. Yeah, so um, let me quickly get back to my sharing and run through the rest um, quite quickly. Uh, so we're almost at the end. And <clears throat> um, just very quickly, uh, we, these are some other things we have in here. Again, um, great stories. This in the corner is a uh, Batek Philippe pocket watch, actually. And the Batek, Batek Philippe pocket watch is, um, you can see it's inscribed, it's, uh, gosh, I don't have my glasses on, I should put them on. It's um, uh, 1889. And then, uh, so this was a Grand Prix à Paris, uh, 1889. And so it is, um, you know, before the turn of the century, it's a gorgeous uh, pocket watch. It does come with an archival certificate. Um, we also have uh, this uh, early Gerard Perigo watch up here. Um, and I wanted to kind of end this part with uh, a couple of pairs of cufflinks uh, so that the, the gentlemen don't feel left out. Um, this has, it has a diamond in the center with a diamond surround. Um, and then it's got green and blue enameling, beautifully done in this, uh, you know, in this um, octagonal shape. And we also have these cufflinks which are um, again set with bulky diamonds. And this is a special kind of sort of um, carved in gold work that's done around this. It, it's, it's a technique um, that you see out of Jaipur. And even, you know, you can see this as well where the um, enameling on the back of the cufflinks is, is beautifully done. Um, again, never to be seen, but, um, but exceptionally uh, created. So I'd like to move on now to um, 
rubies. So we have a couple of lovely rubies. Um, and I've just shown two of the pieces we have in rubies. There's the top one is a Burmese ruby ring. And uh, this is um, an unheated Burmese ruby. Uh, and this is uh, an unheated Mozambique ruby, uh, slightly different color tones. But uh, this Burmese ruby is amazing. It is, it is certified uh, and it's um, a vivid red, um, alluding to the pigeon's blood color. This Mozambique ruby is, is uh, relatively uh, small, but uh, it's, you know, it's about three carats, um, but it's just an absolutely fabulous stone, um, clean as clean can be. Uh, it's, it's just gorgeous. So, I mean, that was a quick question from yes. Amar, uh, just asking the origin. You, you, did, you, you did say the origin of the top ring was uh, Burma, yes, Myanmar. Yes, yes, yes. From Mozambique. Yes. Um, and uh, the, the top ring, that's just under three carats, um, but, but it's quite well priced. Uh, it's a beautiful stone. Aditi, would you like to jump in on that? And I will mute myself here. And Amar uh, Minal is asking, uh, from which lab, uh, Do by which lab? you just tell us about the stone? Yes. From which lab? Yes. Are you able yeah. to identify the lab uh, where the stones were certified? Oh, you know what? Let yes. me stop sharing yes. so you can see that better. Okay. So this Burmese ruby ring has been certified by the GRS. That's the Gem Research Swiss Lab. And the lip report states that it is of Burmese origin and it's a vivid red in color and there is no thermal enhancement. What is the and estimate the, on that, uh, Aditi? What is the estimate? Uh, the estimate is about uh, $27,000, 590. That's a low estimate. And the higher estimate is $34,000, 485. Thank you. Yeah. It's a 2.96 carats ruby. And uh, the Mozambique uh, ruby here is uh, not certified. It doesn't have a certificate, but it does have a very, very deep color. As you can see, it's a beautiful color. I hope that answered the question. I was just going to- you, what, what is the estimate on the Mozambique? On this one? Yes. The estimate on this one is $38,000, 625 is the lower estimate. And the higher estimate is of $52,000, 450. It's a, it's a gem quality, clean, and beautiful colored red. Okay, so I can then move on to our next slide. Um, I'm gonna go back a little bit into design and technique. Um, and, you know, as I talk about sort of art interact, intersecting with, with jewels, um, I wanna sort of point this out really quickly. We came across, um, you know, some young designers doing some very interesting work. And this uh, bird that you see here, uh, this is a micro mosaic technique, um, you know, really comes from a, a more sort of uh, around the 18th century, but, but this is a modern creation. And uh, this is the ring that it's, uh, it's set into it. So there's some really lovely design pieces as well. This is um, a gold wire, it's created a gold filigree out of it. Um, and it has these Mughal motifs in terms of flowers and birds, but it is in that Jan Bali style, which is a, and Jan Bali refers to the sort of crescent shape of the moon. Um, the other last thing I wanted to point out here is this, uh, this modern kara or modern bangle with a very unusual enameling here. And this is a completely modern piece. It's just, you don't see these sorts of motifs in early pieces. So, you know, you had asked about aging and how you can figure it out. You can, you know, certainly um, tell from the, the aesthetics of it also. And I'd like to move on to our last slide on this, which uh, is about the color blue and the stone and, and blue stones, which are particularly important um, in India. Um, you know, blue is uh, sort of rife with, blue in terms of jewelry is rife with, with sort of myth and superstition 
and as I mentioned, has these talismanic properties. Um, in, in India, blue is referred to as, uh, or blue sapphire is referred to as neelam. And um, it's, it's interesting because there's myth around saying that it, it is protection against danger, accidents, theft, bad health. Um, and it also supposedly can accelerate, um, you know, your, your wealth and fame and so on. Uh, it's referred to in astrology uh, um, as being part of the planet Saturn or, or Shani in, in Vedic astrology. And uh, <coughs> in order to wear it, uh, the story goes, you actually have to have it with you for a while. Um, you know, keep it near you, maybe under your pillow when you go to sleep. If you don't have a bad dream and nothing bad happens to you, it sort of, it suits you and uh, will, will bring wonderful things into your life and, and is very powerful. Um, for those who don't want to take the risk with that, uh, there are of course other blues. Uh, we have this. Uh, so this is the this is the sapphire ring that we have. Uh, it's a Sri Lankan sapphire. It's unheated. It is certified. It's about ten carats, just shy of ten carats. Um, and it's really well priced. It's uh, about twenty to twenty four thousand dollars is the estimate. Um, we also have these gorgeous tanzanites. Um, unusual to have them in round shapes. Um, these are about 12 carats um, and, you know, estimated at about uh, nine and a half to eleven thousand dollars, but but really sort of deep, deep blue. And, Nell, can um, you, sure. Nell, can I ask you, yes. do you occasionally have uh, cashmere sapphires come your yes, way? Yes, we do. Um, I don't in this particular sale, but we do. We've dealt quite a bit with cashmere sapphires and um, there are people who wait for them because they've apparently tried it out and their Vedic astrology says that they should be wearing Kashmir sapphires and it's they consider it very powerful and very beneficial to wear them and and others don't but certainly as I mentioned you know there are certain ge geographic regions <clears throat> where uh, it's difficult to mine it's difficult to obtain stones and material uh, and why that's why I alluded to the Panchair emerald where it's very difficult it's impossible to get um, you know, large stones from there any longer. And similarly, when it comes to Kashmir sapphires, obviously, you know, those aren't mines that, um, that can be accessed. So, uh, and, and there isn't material available. So, but we do deal in them um, both in auction and privately. Um, so this, uh, this is a Paraiba uh, and there's been, you know, a lot of talk about Paraibas, a lot of interest in them. Uh, this is uh, a little over seven carats um, and it's on a gorgeous chain you can see here with diamonds and emerald uh, stones as well as paraiba and, and faceted emeralds here um, and that's this a, is estimated is, you know, is, that a, is that a brazilian a paraiba or from another origin i believe it's it's brazilian probably yeah probably brazilian i have to have uh what i will do is when aditi is showing it i'm gonna have her jump in on it so yep. I'm going to stop sharing and let um, Aditi jump in here. So this is the uh, Sri Lankan sapphire. Aditi, would you like to talk about the stones? I'll go ahead and mute myself here. Yes, so this one is certified. It's a little shy of 10 carats as Manal says, so it's 9.99 .99 carats. And it has a GRS certificate again which says it's Sri Lankan and there is no indication of any heat treatment, that's a thermal enhancement. And this was the beautiful pair of tanzanites, which a bit unusual to get circular tanzanites. I'll just go ahead and show you one close up. And a deep, beautiful color with a race setting. And as far as the question for Paraiba, we haven't been really able to ascertain the location for that, but it's possible that it's Brazilian and there is no certificate on that. So we wouldn't like to really go ahead and comment and ascertain that, okay, this is definitely coming from this location. Okay, thank you. So that about brings us to the close um, of our you know, scanning through highlights. Um, and uh, it's really, it's a wonderful sale. It's a great collection of, of some unusual pieces, um, very design oriented, but also some very, very nice stones in there. Um, 
and uh, so that's coming up next week, October 20th and 29th. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minel. Uh, we, we're kind of out of time, but we'll go for two, two questions uh, from okay. the attendees. Um, sure. First one from Anjum Cave. Um, mm -hmm. Have you ever been consigned an item that you really just felt you could not possibly sell? You loved it so much. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, um, yeah, but I, I think we all have limited budgets. My, I have to say my first responsibility is definitely to Saffron Art and to the auctions as opposed to my personal collection. But have I, you know, have I bought some unusual things? Have I bought some things uh, that I look back on and say, gosh, that's really exceptional, yes. Yeah. And the last question, um, Sometimes, because uh, some of the um, antique pieces are, are very old, they presumably ha have been a risk of damage. Um, do, do you often receive damaged pieces? And what, 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 what's your sort of advice in terms of uh, restoration of pieces? Well, you know, that's a tough one. It really depends what it is. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a strong proponent of, of sort of keeping pieces the way they are, the way they were meant to originally be, if they will stand up to it. Um, Actually, Aditi, may I ask you for some help? I'm going to just uh, run through it. I'd like to have a look at um, some of these. So you know, I'd like to point out, just on my screen, if you can, if you can see it, you know, they're not, the enameling isn't perfect. You know, there will be spots where it is a bit affected. But I think that's just part of wearing it, you know. Um, for example, you know, I can show you on the Skara. You know, this is, I mean, it's obviously an old piece. But there are spots where it's, it, it is faded a little. And I know it's difficult to see this online. Um, would I do anything to it? You can kind of see that there. Would I do anything to it? No, I would just leave it the way it is. I have had um, in the past uh, a beautiful enamel piece, which uh, had, a, had a pink mina. Uh, and it's, it, it's called uh, Banarsi mina because it's, it's from the ancient city of Varanasi, which is actually where this pink mina was first introduced onto the subcontinent. Um, and, you know, that is, it's a bit raised. Uh, the way it's painted is very delicate. That's something that I, I would definitely just not touch. I, I would let that be the way it is. Yeah. I mean, certainly trend reports have been showing in the last couple of years that buyers of jewelry and collectors increasingly celebrate imperfection. Yes. In the digitized world. And they appreciate the craftsmanship and the story behind these pieces. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, just could we just sum up uh, the process for those who wish to um, bid uh, in the auction, how they should go ahead? I, I know you explained this earlier, but just for anybody who's just joined uh, later in the webinar, could you just quickly recap uh, the way in which people can register and bid for pieces in sure. the October 28-29 auction? Of course. You know what I'm going to do? I have a quick, uh, it's terrible that I'm going to do this, but I have a quick visual on it. Oh, did I shut that down? I think I did. Okay. Um, so I'll just talk you through it. Um, the easiest thing to do is if you have an iOS, if, if you have uh, an iPhone, you know, go to your app store, download the, Sa the Saffron Art app, register to bid. Um, and once you register, and your information's in there, you will have access to the catalog. Uh, however, to enter bids, um, the, you just have to go through a short know your customer process. We have a client representative at Saffron Art who will reach out and get your information from you. Um, and we can then get you set up. And it, it, I mean, it's really just a 24 hour turnaround until you're ready to bid. Um, so you can place advanced bids on the app. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, you can, once you're registered, you can be on the phone with us and, uh, you know, during a closing, you can, you can actually talk to someone live who will enter your bids for you. Um, and, or you can bid from your, your computer, uh, you know, and, and as you're bidding, I think the important thing about this online auction to understand is it's, it's actually incredibly easy and it's far more comfortable in some ways than a live auction because you have a great deal more information to make a decision. You can uh, take a look at bid histories. You can see who else has bid. In some cases, you can see comparables. In other cases, if you if there's a bid that comes in, and I want to explain the closing. So there are groups of lots that close. About every 20 lots or so will close. And it's in the back of the catalog. 
hotel where you can check the closing time. So if you're on lot 20, uh, that's the one you're bidding on. If it closes, let's say at 8 p.m. India time, um, and at 7.59, there's a bid and you think, oh gosh, I haven't gotten in there. That closing time gets extended by a couple of minutes. So you have a little more time to come back and make a decision. It's very, it's not like, you know, you're in a live sale room and the auctioneer is going, okay, I can only wait so long. And, uh, you know, you can take a little time for your decision making. Look, Minel, thank you so much for your time today, uh, explaining the process of, of bidding uh, in these wonderful online auctions for fine jewels. Um, the date is October 28, 29, uh, the Saffron Art Fine Jewels online auction. Uh, thank you for presenting those highlighted uh, pieces today and, and the education and entertainment you've imparted in terms of explaining to us the heritage and craftsmanship of Indian jewelry making. So thank you everybody uh, for joining you, us. Um, appreciate your time. Stay safe and goodbye. Bye-bye.